Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar uh, group. Uh, first, keep your phones off, then if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation or after his present presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming dear Professor Karim Gamal. Karim Gamal is one of the top accounting thought leaders in the world. Karim Gamal is a professor and the department chair of accounting and business analysis uh, at the University of Alberta. Uh, Dr. Gamal is a past chair of uh, the American Accounting Association's Financial Accounting Standards Committee. Uh, Dr. Gamal, uh, primary research focus is on uh, auditor balancing uh, of uh, fraud deductions, various uh, client certifications, disclosures, and its effect on conflict of interest, and discussions with the audit uh, committee, private uh, market for accounting and auditing, regulatory failure in auditing. Dr. Jamal uh, research has been published into ranking journals in accounting. He holds many of the scientific honors and awards, uh, including a fellow of Chartered uh, Accounting, Alberta. Uh, him uh, big aware the for the thing that to accounting sorts of the, uh, the Canadian uh, account, American, the Canadian, uh, academic Accounting Association, uh, CBA, and uh, Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, Thoughts, Leadership, and Contribution to the Accounting conducted in uh, the Canadian uh, Accounting Hall of Fame. Now we will start our seminar with the Dr. Karim Gemin. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh... Very kind introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to serve here. And uh, welcome to all the guests from uh, across many time zones. So I don't know whether to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all. I, I assume uh, probably all of them are relevant uh, today. Let me start with uh, what we'll call a territorial uh, acknowledgement. So at least in Canada, uh, this has now uh, become standard uh, uh, for presentations at universities. And so the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Treaty 6 territory, which are the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Just uh, to give you one additional piece of Canadiana, uh, the treaties were written uh, between the indigenous tribes uh, and the crown, which means uh, the, the king of England, I guess. And uh, they were meant to be in perpetuity. And so uh, at least when they were written in English on the English version, uh, said that the treaties would last uh, as long as the sun shines, uh, the grass grows, uh, and the river flows. Okay. Uh, I want to talk today a little bit about why auditors uh, perform very poorly on some tasks. And there are many reasons, obviously, that we uh, can come up with. Uh, Usually the topics uh, of fraud detection are going concern. Uh, the more recent one is, of course, CAM reporting, which uh, I view as a huge failure in auditing, but which is maybe not uh, appreciated yet in the research literature as to how bad that is. Um, and the basic thrust of my argument is today is going to be that uh, when the regulator uh, wants something that's incongruent with what the audit committee wants, uh, the, basically the auditor has to choose. And what the auditor is going to choose is to go with the audit committee. And so what's going to happen is you're going to end up with an unhappy regulator. Uh, so that's going to be the thrust. Uh, but but behind that is this notion of managerial influence and that there's a great deal of managerial influence on what the auditor does and maybe 
that level of influence is, I think, uh, maybe underappreciated. Uh, again, of course, that's not something uh, that auditors will talk about freely because uh, that that's the kind of thing you don't talk about. So uh, we're doing a case study on CAM reporting. So I'll kind of start off there. Um, so that's a relatively new uh, development in, uh, in auditing. Uh, it's not very well understood. Uh, it's got contradictory findings between the archival and experimental literatures. In the archival literatures, uh, largely you get no effects most of the time for much of everything. In the experimental literature, uh, you get all kinds of effects, uh, sometimes even very strange effects uh, where the audit, where the management changes its uh, production function even based on what comes out in one of these reports. Uh, on the archival side, it's pretty clear that the, uh, the new audit report is basically kind of the old audit report plus a whole bunch of boilerplate. And so basically uh, there's just really nothing, there's nothing new in any of this stuff. Um, again, just to take a little bit of a digression into history, uh, the first audit report of what I'll call the modern era uh, had only one line in it, kind of uh, was audited and approved, which uh, was a audit report issued by a fellow called William uh, W. Deloitte, who uh, was a one-man audit firm at that time. Uh, he called himself an accountant. There was no notion of being an auditor, and I uh, put the date down. Uh, Mr. Deloitte was a man of few words, so he didn't like to write lots of words. Uh, uh, but then other people who tried to compete with him, particularly Edwin Waterhouse, when, when Edwin Waterhouse started to try and uh, build an audit practice for Price Waterhouse. Uh, they tried to differentiate themselves from Deloitte on a range of dimensions, uh, one of which was writing accounting standards. And so one of the earliest cases of uh, writing accounting standards was uh, Edwin Waterhouse started to write his own accounting standards. And if you wanted an audit from Price Waterhouse, uh, he would want you to follow Price Waterhouse's accounting standards, and then and then Deloitte started doing the same thing too, and so Deloitte started writing down accounting standards. And if you wanted an audit from Deloitte, uh, he would ask you to follow his accounting standards. Uh, and eventually, we got to what I call long form audit reports, um, although always somewhere in there, uh, the auditor would approve uh, or certify the financial statements. Okay, and, and Stephen Zeff has a huge set of papers about uh, losing that, moving away from fairly stated to in compliance with GAAP. But that's not how it started. It started as uh, the, they literally approved the financial statements or certified them as being correct. So in a free market, that, that's what you see. And so the, this is at a time when uh, there are no written, uh, there are no standard setting boards. There are no laws requiring auditors uh, to be hired. Uh, there are no written accounting standards. There are no written auditing standards. And what you see is uh, some of these things starting to arise. Uh, but in each firm, so each firm starts writing its own accounting standards and, and each firm starts writing its own audit manuals. And the firms that tend to write more like Price Waterhouse uh, start writing one, sometimes two page audit reports uh, versus the one line from Deloitte uh, versus everything else in between. Uh, and the longer audit reports tend to do what they call user education. So they identify key risks. 
and they try to tell people what the auditor did. Again, this is at a time when people didn't know much about what auditors were, uh, and there were no requirements as to what the auditor should do. Uh, anybody could call themselves an auditor, so they tried to tell people what the auditor did. Uh, in about the 1930s, uh, this, this stuff gets stopped. So as, as you get into the Securities Acts of 1933 and 34, and then you get the New York Stock Exchange getting involved, uh, they decide to start standardizing all this stuff. So you have a range from people write one line audit report to one paragraph to two paragraph to a whole page to maybe two pages. Uh, and they decide uh, they're gonna standardize this stuff. Uh, so you get your pass fail report uh, and you get basically some boilerplate added to it. Uh, and you get this kind of tie to gap so that uh, you stop talking about certifying, you stop talking about fair presentation. Uh, yeah, everything is in refers to gap. And you start putting conditions on materiality and things of that sort kind of become part of the standard report. So that's kind of what happens as, as, the, as the profession gets regulated. Uh, of course, uh, for about eight day, decades then, the standardized reports uh, stay in place. A huge set of changes occur in the meantime. Standard setting boards get set up. Uh, written accounting and auditing standards up, uh, arise. Uh, mandatory audit laws get passed. Uh, it gets almost to the point where, where people forget uh, that there was a private demand for audit and start to think of audit as being done because of the law. And then the law somehow just arises and, and makes people do these things. Uh, now investors start to complain that the standard audit report is not useful, <laughs> that, that uh, they're not learning anything. They know a great deal about accounting standards. They know a great deal about what auditors do. Uh, the auditor is not telling them anything. Uh, the auditor knows a lot, uh, knows a lot about what happens inside the company, uh, but the audit report doesn't convey much or uh, of what the auditor knows. And so the auditor, so various investor groups start to complain uh, that the audit report isn't useful and uh, uh, they're not getting any value. Uh, again, people would sometimes say things like, you know, nobody reads the audit report. And the implication would be that there's something to be learned by reading the audit report. Uh, but but in most of the time, there's nothing to be learned by reading the audit report. It's it's uh, it's just boilerplate. Sign your name. You name you learn the name of the auditor and the date, and that's about it. Uh, and then the auditor doesn't tell you anything. So now a new uh, a quest occurs for a new audit report. Uh, the regulator wants it, certain investor groups want it, uh, but companies don't want it. Uh, the companies just want the auditor uh, to be a pass-fail kind of uh, report, uh, like a government auditor. So in another paper, we did a study of kind of certification reports in the government versus private sector. And in the government, almost all the time, not all the time, but almost all the time, uh, reports are pass-fail. Uh, do you meet the minimum standard uh, you know, for electricity in your home? If you do, uh, you get a pass and uh, you're, you can build your house and live in it. Uh, if you go to a restaurant, does it meet the minimum standard of cleanliness. If it does, uh, the restaurant gets a pass. Uh, if it gets a pass, uh, it, it's open and people can go and consume meals there. 
So the whole public sector certification regime uh, is based on a notion of uh, we're setting minimum standards. This is the absolute minimum you need to meet. Uh, we'll inspect you. Uh, if you get a pass, that's good enough. Uh, if you want to be a better or cleaner restaurant than, than other restaurants, uh, that's fine. Uh, how you signal that is up to you. Uh, you find that out yourself. Uh, we don't care. Okay, uh, we're not we're not in the business of that. Uh, in the private sector, if you look more broadly at standard setting and certification, you find the exact opposite. You want to buy a car. You want to buy a, a bottle of wine. You want to buy a baseball card. Uh, there are rating scales, uh, cars you got ratings, uh, you know, one to a hundred. There are subscales, uh, the car gets rated on safety and fuel efficiency and number of mechanical complaints and uh, the whole kinds of subscales are there and there's all kinds of information provided and uh, rated on. Again, that's not to say that private sector rating is 100% like that, but roughly around 80 to 90% of private sector rating would, would involve a grade of some kind or grades, subgrades. Uh, and of course, universities are offer grades to students. For the most part, we don't just give pass fail. Uh, and the government tends to be the opposite. So in an interesting sense, auditing, as we've set it up, is set up more like a government service uh, than, than like a private service. Uh, even though it started as a private service, it didn't start as a, as a government stuck service. Uh, what you would see if you look into this uh, cab reporting session is a huge lobbying effort starts now where companies and audit committees and auditors uh, start to uh, first they try not try to defeat the standard, uh, try to say uh, no, we don't want this. And then when they see that they are not getting anywhere, and it seems like this is going to come, uh, then they start lobbying for uh, the auditor should not say anything new. So the auditor should be allowed to say something as long as whatever they say <laughs> is not new. Okay. Uh, so, and that's kind of how it prevails, actually. So they water down the standard uh, during the lobbying process. And uh, there are various experimental results suggesting auditors might benefit from being able to issue CAMs, but at least in their public behavior, auditors don't show that. They don't act as if they think uh, they'll benefit from any of this stuff. They, they uniformly oppose this stuff. And if they can't knock it out, they, they water it down. Okay. They try as much as they can. Uh, that doesn't mean the experimental results are wrong. It just mean, it might mean that the auditors uh, are just doing what the AC and the CFOs want. And that, that's more powerful than whatever you might find if you were only studying auditors, okay. Uh, so what do we get in terms of the archival record? Uh, basically, uh, what's a key audit matter or a critical audit matter? There's this very, very small difference in uh, definition between the International Accounting Standards Board and the US uh, standard. Uh, the US standard is much more narrow. And so what you can call a critical audit matter has to be a direct financial statement item. It has to be something like revenue uh, or an impairment or, or something that would hit the financial statement. So in some sense, it's almost back to the days of Edwin Waterhouse. Uh, the international standard is much broader. Uh, so you could call COVID uh, a CAM in the international standard. 
Uh, you could not do that in the U.S. Okay, the U.S. would not count that as as a camp. Uh, internal control can be called a, if there are problems in internal control uh, that can be called uh, a camp in the international standard. Uh, it cannot be called that in the U.S. standard. So sometimes when you see complaints about U.S. companies like Silicon Valley Bank or which goes under, and then people say, why won't why won these things camps? Uh, well, under the U.S. rules, those are not camps. Okay, So if there are weaknesses in internal control, if there are weaknesses in the business model of the company, uh, in the international side, that could be called a CAM, but in the US side, that cannot, okay, that doesn't qualify. Uh, again, what we see is, cup, is auditor speaking as few CAMs as possible. And in the US, the least number of CAMs, which again is opposite of what the experiment suggests. Okay, so if CAM is providing legal protection, then the experiments suggest uh, you should have lots of cans. Uh, but actually, uh, when we look across jurisdictions, uh, as legal risk rises, uh, you get actually the opposite result. You get less can. And so the US has the least cans. Uh, then if you come into Canada, you'll find slightly more cans. And if you go into Europe, uh, you'll find even more camps. Okay, so so part of that is a rule change because you can call more things cam if you're under the international rules. Uh, but part of that still is a choice, and it seems like uh, there's a variation across geography. So as you go into jurisdictions that have very low legal risk, uh, you find that picking more camps, but but that's actually opposite of what the experimental results in the US uh, suggest. Uh, as we talk to companies, uh, what we find is they benchmark competitors. So if there's some kind of timing difference between when companies have to issue these camps, a way to see what their competitors wrote. Uh, a lot of times they even call up their competitors and they kind of, uh, organize as an industry uh, what they're going to write. Uh, obviously, the auditors are monitoring very carefully uh, what CAMs are being written across industries and across jurisdictions. So if the UK went first and you're auditing a manufacturing company, you know what do CAMs in manufacturing companies in the UK look like? Uh, the audit firm has all of that in their database, are very, very keen to benchmark against uh, kind of well, a standard that the, that the same audit firm has used before in the same industry. Uh, and then they try to write as much boilerplate as possible. Uh, so they, if they want to write along report, they, they write lots, but they try to say nothing, okay? Uh, this is controlled very tightly from uh, head office, uh, very detailed templates. And sometimes if you, when you're talking to the audit partner, they'll almost tell you, uh, you know, we got this comp, this very tight template and we have to write it a certain way for a certain industry and in the US, they'll say something like, I can't even change a comma, you know. Uh, literally, uh, head office is dictating kind of what this is gonna look like. Uh, in Canada, they claim, of course, that they could, but but of course, uh, they won't because, again, head office is kind of, so there's a lot of head office time going into this. So it's kind of costly for the audit firm uh, because some managers writing this stuff uh, but then the partner has to review it and has to send it to head office. And, and somebody in head office is spending a, a lot of time uh, making sure this stuff is standardized and given out the way head office wants it to come. Uh, the other thing that we see in this, in this what I'll call case study, um, is a lot of advance notice given uh, both to the AC and the CFO. Uh, 
uh, about what will be called the can. Sorry, so, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please say that again? So some people, um, you know, worry that uh, that a CAM reporting will occur at the end of the year and create a crunch, a time crunch at the end of the year. But but actually, that's not true. Uh, the CAM report is actually written at least two quarters before the end of the year. Uh, the AC and the CFO know what 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 what's going to be called the CAM. Uh, the, they know how it's going to be written. Uh, they're, they're actually invited uh, to help rewrite it, which is kind of an unusual thing because you, you, you kind of talk about negotiation in accounting uh, and you would not normally think of negotiation of the audit report, but, but, but here actually they're, they're kind of negotiating the writing of the audit report. Uh, so in the literature, you might see something about what's being called a dry run. Uh, and a dry run effectively means uh, that, that the actual report and the way it's going to be reported uh, are given to the CFO and, and the audit committee ahead of time. And those guys actually not only read it, but but can kind of decide uh, to ask for changes in how uh, items are described. Okay, so so the big concern of the AAC is uh, well, number one, they don't want you to say anything new. Uh, they don't want any any item flag that everybody already doesn't know about. Uh, but then the other thing is they don't want the auditor talking about a risk in a way that's not consistent with how the company talks about the risk. And so they want kind of the auditors writing to fit kind of how the company reports this stuff. Uh, so they're very keen to look at the detailed writing of this uh, and kind of wordsmithing uh, to make sure the auditor's not somehow saying something that doesn't fit what they would want to say. Uh, so one of the things we haven't checked, but uh, which comes up when we present some of this stuff, is the possibility that this might generate better disclosure from management. So before the audit report comes out, if management knows several quarters or sometimes even years in advance, uh, this is what the auditor is going to call a CAM. Uh, and if kind of the implicit deal is uh, with the auditor that uh, you keep you keep quiet and uh, uh, I'll talk, uh, then that means the management should say more. Uh, so we haven't looked at that, but one possibility is that the archival uh, studies don't find anything uh, because they start looking for something to happen after the audit report comes out uh, because they think the information is coming from the auditor. But but actually, uh, if there is any information coming out, uh, it may be coming from management, but coming before the audit report comes out. So they start beefing up their disclosure. So the, possibly there is a benefit, but it's coming uh, from there. But we haven't checked that. But that, that might be something for archival people. Uh, it might turn out uh, that uh, they might find something there. Okay. Uh, some people have raised the issue of whether the change in a CAM might be an interesting signal. And so the initial set of CAMs themselves might not be informative. But then if I suddenly change a CAM, uh, then that might signal that something new is happening in the company and uh, then investors might start to, to worry about why did this change occur and what does this change in the CAM mean and that may be just an advance warning that something's coming at you next okay the other possibility of course is that since CAMs are widely known uh, everybody knows that uh, you, you 
couldn't be a, a decent investor in the company without knowing the key risks of the company. And if, if, the, if that's all the CAM is telling you, uh, then really they're, they're telling you nothing. And at least in terms of analyst meetings, and the, there's no evidence that anybody pays attention to this stuff and nobody asks any questions about it and nobody seems to care. <laughs> Uh, what that CAM was. Uh, the other interesting finding that we have is that the audit committee refuses to pay uh, for the CAM. Again, that shows up on the in the archival literature. Uh, so in the archival literature, they cannot find any change in audit fee. And then the question becomes whether there's noise or, or something else. But at least when we start looking and talking to audit committee members uh, or, or CFOs, uh, they are insistent that they will not pay. They will not pay extra uh, for, for a cap. So this is kind of a bad news for the auditor because the uh, auditor has to do a lot of work and a lot of very senior work, a lot of time from uh, head office, a lot of time from partner level, uh, and, then the, and then the audit committee refuses to pay. They, they don't want to pay. So again, I think this is not uh, appreciated in the literature yet, but there's actually one big loser in this story, uh, and the big loser in the story is the auditor. Okay. Uh, the auditor has to manage a relationship with the uh, audit committee, who's very nervous about what the auditor is going to say, uh, with the CFO, who's also very nervous uh, about what the auditor is going to say, uh, who don't like CAM, don't want the auditor to say anything. Uh, there's some unknown legal exposure. Uh, I just saw a paper. Uh, in the SSRN yesterday saying uh, if you have a CAM and it's on revenue uh, and then your revenue goes down, you're actually more likely to get sued. It's as if the litigation lawyers are, are actually using CAM to find cases for how to go sue people. Uh, so at least uh, it's not really clear whether CAM will actually trigger more lawsuits uh, or CAM will protect you from lawsuits. Uh, uh, this is completely new, so we'll find out. Uh, the initial experimental literature was suggested you, you'll be protected from lawsuits. Uh, there's nothing that the audit firms have ever done that suggests they believe that. Uh, and if the current papers coming out are true, then they actually will attract more law lawsuits rather than, uh, and maybe will help you fight them as well. Uh, but that's unknown. Uh, whether this will cause regulatory problems is also uh, not completely known. Uh, auditors uh, express a great deal of concern uh, about how PCAOB will look at this stuff. Uh, head office is very, concerned that whatever goes into a CAM uh, should be word for word the same uh, to what was reported to the audit committee. And what was reported to the audit committee should be word for word the same to what's in the audit file. And so there's a, there's a great deal of concern that any discrepancy uh, uh, that that occurs across multiple places where a particular CAM risk is discussed uh, could trigger some kind of PCOB action. Uh, so, so they need to make sure that that doesn't occur. Again, that suggests there's a lot of cop copying and pasting going on uh, and you want to make sure your wording is just identical and there's no extra word added anywhere. So. Whatever you said in the CAM, uh, you've got the documented everywhere else exactly the same way. Again, we don't know whether PCOB will look at these things or do anything with them, but uh, uh, 
at least a great deal of concern is raised. Uh, no extra audit fee, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of a bummer. So <laughs> all of this work, all of this worry about whether it triggers lawsuits or not, whether it triggers PCOV or not, whether it triggers the audit committee or not, uh, and then and then you don't get paid anything. Okay? So at least in one of the companies that we were looking at, uh, when they did the evaluation of the auditor at the end of the year within the company, uh, this issue was added in. So when the audit committee did a formal review of the auditor, uh, they were asked to assess how well the auditor had handled the CAM uh, issue. Uh, so, so again, that's that's uh, another point of to be nervous about for the for the auditor uh, with no fee. So that's kind of not fun. Okay. Um, again, in discussions, uh, auditors never mention any of this kind of stuff if they can help it. Uh, they never talk about the AC's preference. They never talk about the CFO's preference. Uh, they never try and talk about anything about client pressure. Uh, those are kind of things audit partners try very hard not to talk about ever. Uh, so they'll give you some cover story about hurting, uh, they blame the PCAOB, uh, that's easy. Uh, anytime you have some outcome uh, you don't like, uh, you just blame the PCAOB or fear of PCAOB or fear of lawsuit, uh, but that's because you don't want to talk about you don't want to talk about what the CFO wants or or, or what the AC wants or, or that that you're trying to line up with what they want. Uh, so you never mentioned then the audit partner left without being pressed, uh, never mentions uh, the AC and never mentions the CFO and never mentions their preferences. And these things just don't come up unless you really press them, they just will not even talk about these things. So again, that's possibly a problem for uh, studies in which uh, people are being interviewed, uh, uh, field studies of various kinds. Uh, these are not the kind of things uh, they will talk about. Uh, if you talk to the AC, then the AC will start talking about this and they'll start telling you about what they were worried about and how they expressed it to the auditor and how the auditor came up with the dry run and what they did in the dry run. And if you talk to the CFO, then the CFO will tell you about these things. Uh, so again, uh, if you talk to the CFO and the AC and the auditor, uh, you'll get a very different view of what's going on uh, than if you only talk to the auditor. Okay. If you only talk to the auditor, they'll never talk about any of this stuff. Okay. It'll never come up. Again, that might be an issue for a lot of uh, behavioral studies. Uh, you need to triangulate again across multiple agents. Uh, otherwise, you get a very one-sided kind of cover story where they just don't want to talk about certain things. Yeah, question from uh, Mudar. Uh uh, thank you, uh, Professor Ka Karim. I just wanted to ask what you meant by uh, herding. I mean, uh, cover story about herding. Yeah. Can so one, one detail, please. Yeah. So one of the things is, you know, if, if auditors are asked, you know, how come you do this boilerplate, then they say, oh, you know, we just follow what other uh, what other ah, auditors okay, are okay, doing, that's clear, and you know, the companies are also kind of following each other. And so then, you know, we just, uh, and partly I could, I could tell you a head office story and uh, and the head office wants all the auditors, all the partners and the, all the different offices uh, to be issuing the same kind of report. Uh, and so they don't want every office to be offering a different report. So there's a lot of pressure to kind of issue the same kind of report uh, that, that everybody else uh, issued. And sometimes you can argue that within your own firm, that you want all the partners in your firm to issue the same kind of report. 
uh, for the same kind of company. Uh, or you could even argue that across the whole industry and say, you know, uh, if I've got a manufacturing firm and one auditor uh, gives a particular kind of CAM report, then I want to give the same kind of CAM report. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'll get into trouble or somebody will come and fight with me and ask how come I get a different report than somebody else did, right? So that's a, that's an easy way of kind of dodging the question of why are you all giving the same report and it's kind of kind of blaming it on head office or 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 just you know we just look at what other people do and we kind of do that well, thank uh, but, you. That does, but that doesn't make you talk about the client or the pressure or the, what the audit committee wants or what the CFO wants or you know you don't you, you dodge all of those discussions uh, you don't you don't mention any of that stuff uh, in terms of winners, uh, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that any user pays attention. Uh, there's no questions ever asked anywhere. There's no market reactions. Uh, it's not clear anybody learns anything new. Uh, if you ask audit partners, uh, they, they admit that they don't say anything new and that they try very hard not to say anything at all, actually. Uh, which is kind of what the archival studies tend to show. Uh, most of the time, uh, either no effect on anything or very little effect on something. Okay. Uh, the experiments are a little bit different, I think, uh, partly because I think they suggest to people that some kind of new information is being produced. And what we see then is people react to that. Uh, so it's possible that even within this pass fail kind of model, uh, if CAM was implemented properly, in the sense that the auditor actually tried to tell people something useful, uh, that might work, okay? Uh, there are people like myself who feel you know, that they should have gone to a much different kind of grading system. But even if you didn't do that, uh, the experimental results suggest that it could have worked if people had done it properly. Uh, it also suggests that there's going to be a lot of expertise in writing boilerplate. So we talk about you know how audit firms are going to need people who know a lot about data analytics or AI or whatever. Uh, they're also going to need lots of people who know how to write boilerplate because they're going to be writing a lot of boilerplate. And uh, audit reports are going to become a lot longer, uh, but they're going to become mostly boilerplate. Uh, that's going to get added in and become very expert at, at standardizing the boilerplate and adding it everywhere, which is a general problem with disclosure You know, in general. Uh, if you put in too many disclosure requirements, uh, the risk to you always is that people just write a lot, but but what they write doesn't actually tell you anything. Uh, so so it seems like they've kind of settled on that strategy in auditing, where they're just going to write a lot and and they won't tell you anything. Uh, I won't spend too much time on going concern, but we could tell a similar kind of story in going concern. Uh, basically, uh, the company starts getting into trouble. Uh, everybody has a model uh, that, that they can use and uh, people start becoming worried. Uh, they all know things are going bad. Uh, again, the regulator and certain investors want uh, a more timely signal from the auditor. And then, of course, the company doesn't want that. Uh, the CFO and the audit committee are pressuring the auditor not to, not to give that signal. Uh, maybe, again, promising the same kind of deal. Uh, we'll, we'll start giving more disclosure. Uh, you don't do that. Okay. And then again, what we start seeing is uh, the auditors generally very late uh, in giving a signal. Uh, many times, uh, no signal at all. Uh, the company actually goes under. 
uh, and our signal is received, and then everyone's yelling and screaming about, you know, uh, how come no signal came? Uh, so, but the auditor is under tremendous pressure not to give the signal from inside, uh, although there's pressure from outside to, to say something earlier. Uh, but, but we see them kind of not doing that. Okay. Uh, and, and, and a lot of times people are perplexed when the company goes completely under and nothing was ever said. Uh, uh, again, I know we, we have problems understanding these competing pressures. Uh, so it's easy to tell a story about litigation and it's easy to tell a story about regulation. And then it's kind of hard to tell a story about the client pressure and how it operates. And maybe we don't understand that side too well. Uh, again, in U U.S. Uh, settings, uh, legal pressures are very significant. And so maybe those stories make sense, at least to, to a large extent, even if they may not be complete. Uh, when you get out of U.S. settings, uh, increasingly those stories don't make sense. So you start moving into settings that have much less legal pressure, uh, then, then uh, coming up with legal stories or regulatory stories uh, don't really make a lot of sense here. Yeah? So we, we tend to talk like Americans. Uh, but for most of us who are not in, in the US, uh, uh, we live in regimes that have very little legal pressure and we have very different regulators and maybe much less aggressive regulators. And, uh, but we also don't talk very much about clients. And so we tend to kind of underestimate client pressure, I think. Uh, and as I've said earlier, uh, auditors tend not to talk about such things. So uh, people will not openly talk about client concerns and, and what clients want or how clients put pressure to get what they want. So yeah. we tend to, I think, understand and underestimate that. So yeah, Dr. Samir, have a good uh, Great presentation, uh, Karim. Uh, would you expect, uh, you know, when... Uh, a company get cross-listed in the US and now the auditor is not operating in a German setting or France or Canadian. Now he's gonna change the regulator environment. How this is gonna change like? Yeah, so I think that, I mean, so that's kind of the bonding hypothesis, right? So one way I signal to people uh, that I'm going to be more like an American company yeah. uh, is I go and list on a U.S. exchange. Um, I subject myself to a PCOB audit, right? Uh, and, I, and I subject myself to U.S. disclosure requirements and other whatever governance requirements and regulatory, you know, oversight. Uh, so if I'm a company in India and I want to signal to people in India that you know I'm I'm different from a company in India, I'm I'm different from the rest of the companies in India. You know, uh, that would be the that would be one of the reasons to list on a U.S. exchange. Uh, besides, you know, uh, the depth of the market and the ability to raise capital and all of those things. But the but the bonding hypothesis would be uh, I'll be better. Yep than a regular in, you know, Indian company. I may not be the same as a regular American company. Uh, so you know, there is a concern about whether foreign registrants, uh, even of the PCLB, uh, meet kind of the same standard that, you know, say American registrants of, of the PCLB need. But, but they'll be better than their home country. Uh, yeah. Comparators. So, uh, so if you pick the Canadian company and uh, it listed on the U.S., then it would start to act differently uh, than if it was only on a Canadian exchange, right? Uh, so sometimes uh -huh. Canadian auditors, when when you talk to them, uh, they'll talk to you about U.S. as well because they have clients. You know, they have some clients who are only on the Canadian market. 
and they have some clients either of their own or or their partners who are also cross listed in the US uh, and at least they themselves feel that there's a difference in how you know those two sets of companies operate uh, then of course they have private clients and and then that that's like a different world uh, and so the the pressures on the private side are very different but even within the public side yeah if you if you become a PCOB registrant uh, you'll be treated differently by the audit firm and and the audit firm will worry about things in a different way uh, yep. because they'll try and and match what they think, uh, yeah. and, and they experience PCLB uh, inspections, which are different <laughs> from the inspection they would get, you know, from the Canadian regulator, and they would get different penalties also. Uh, so the PCLB might give them a big penalty if they're found not to be behaving in the way that PCLB wants them to behave, but the Canadian auditor may not may not do that. You know, so the Canadian regulator may not give them the same kind of penalty and may not shout at them in the same way, may not disclose anything about who they are or what they did or, you know, so so there's a huge difference, you know, in the U.S. you get you can get written up and uh, you can even have a, a report that identifies you uh, as, the, uh, as the one who had a problem and, and then in the Canadian system maybe uh, they can't do that. They're not allowed to, and so they would never, they would never write you up, and they would never talk about you, and nobody would ever know that you were the one who had a problem doing your inspection, right? Uh, so that would have to leak in a different way. It's possible that these things leak, uh, but they're not officially reported. But yeah, I think there's a difference if you if you go across and cross list. Uh, you're you're asking to be under a different regulatory regime, and you will be treated differently. And and in some sense, you're you're claiming that you will behave differently yourself, right? Uh, that's why you're cross listing. Uh, again, in fraud. Again, I'll talk very briefly in fraud. Uh, uh, in a free market, of course, fraud detection is uh, very, very important. Uh, all the people whose names you see on the big audit firms uh, made their names by, you know, being fraud detectors and catching people and exposing them, Deloitte and Waterhouse, and even Arthur Anderson, you know, became famous for uh, finding a fraud in Chicago and, and disclosing it. And, refusing whatever bribe the company was offering. Uh, but that's a different world. That's a world where, you know, these guys work directly for the suppliers of capital. You know, they're working for, you know, uh, big in, uh, financiers. You know, you work for JP Morgan or something and you convince him, you know, in a world in which uh, there are no laws requiring him to hire an auditor, uh, you know, you convince him to hire you uh, and you're going to keep the management in line and you're going to keep everybody else in line, right? And you're going to report them if you find something. Uh, in a regulated market, that, that stuff all goes away. Uh, it's not just a regulated market, but it's a different kind of market. Uh, you know, it's, you don't have a J.P. Morgan running the company anymore. And management's running the company. And so now if, if you, who are you going to, who are you going to report the highest level of management to? Uh, Actually, you know, under the way the reporting structure is set up, you can't even report them to anybody. Uh, so there are these no clear laws coming in now. We're trying to figure out if you had a problem at the highest level of the company, who would you even report these people to, right? Uh, so this whole expectation gap thing is kind of murky you're trying to limit how much responsibility you have for, for fraud and then you're trying to kind of dodge as much as you can and not actually say i'm not responsible for finding fraud because then people go crazy uh so at the lower level of the system it's fine you're happy to catch lower level employees who misbehave 
We're happy to catch errors. We're happy to catch all kinds of small things. When you get into top management, then you know things become dicey. Uh, catching top management's <laughs> not uh, not so much kind of what the auditor wants to do, right? And and if he doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, it's not really clear who you'd report it to either. And so the the things become really messy if you if you have a problem at the highest level. Uh, the only final comment I'll make on that one is that, you know, if fraud detection is really the true underlying function of auditing, then, then I think the audit fun profession is in deep trouble because uh, it's it's not carrying out that function very well in terms of policing the top management at the highest level. So it's much easier at the lower level, uh, but but at the high level, it's very hard. Uh, so the governance side is kind of shaky because it's hard to hold the highest levels of management uh, in line. So uh, with that, I'll stop uh, and uh, see if anybody has any questions or... Uh, thank you very much, Gamal, uh, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Now, if anyone have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Samir? Yeah. Um, Karim, a great presentation. I mean, again, but um, my question is uh, around the, the training. Like, will the training and the... Um, how advanced is the accounting profession uh, is um, has an impact on auditor performance, perf poor performance on these kind of tasks, you know? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, my view is uh, students uh, get taught that, you know, auditing is a great profession and uh, they're supposed to have all these professional values and uh, you know they're kind of uh, taught all this stuff and then they go out into practice and then actually in practice uh, what the regulators have done uh, since the early 1970s is uh, basically deprofessionalized auditing so uh, and this is not just a problem of auditing. This is a problem of all the professions. And so in the 1970s, uh, theories of efficient markets and markets regulating people with competition uh, started becoming popular with regulators. And uh, the regulators started to sue, especially in the US, uh, professional associations and said, you know, the codes of conduct that you have and all this professional stuff you are teaching uh, is actually, uh, you know, constraints against trade. These are just restraints on trade and you're just uh, trying to make money uh, by restricting competition. Uh, in the U.S., a lot of uh, individuals started to sue their professional associations. So lawyers started to sue uh, state law societies. Uh, individual accountants started to sue CPA state societies. And then the Federal Trade Commission came in and started suing. Uh, and so the AICPA ultimately kind of gave up. But, but the same problem occurred in law. And the same problem occurred in medicine. And a large part of the professional regulation that actually restricted competition and created a professional environment, rules about uh, advertising, rules about solicitation of clients, lowballing of fees. You know, when I started as an auditor, uh, all of this stuff was outlawed. If you did any of these things, they would throw you out of the profession as for unprofessional conduct. Uh, then all of this stuff become legal. 
Uh, and uh, the professional association could not enforce any of these rules. Uh, so actually what happens in real life is we teach people a bunch of stuff and then they go out to work and then they find that everything we taught them or at least large portions of what we taught them is completely wrong. <laughs> and the firm doesn't work like that at all. Uh, so the firm works and uh, at the end of the audit, the, the, you know, the client is asked, the client being management is asked to fill out a customer satisfaction form and rates you if you're the auditor on uh, how, how easy it was to work with you and how responsive you were to them and how much you, whatever, you know, basically how good you were to them and how much uh, the firm has star clients based on how much money the, 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 the client pays. And, uh, you know, so, so the firm is managed like a business. And it has a sense of who its best customers are, and it assigns its staff accordingly. And it, uh, if the if the if the client says, "I don't like this partner," <laughs> so you know, if you, anyway, I'll just say one more thing. If the client says, "I don't like this partner," you know, the audit firm takes the partner out and gives them a new partner. Uh, so. So there's a huge discrepancy between what we're teaching and the world in which these guys are actually practicing. And so when you go to PCAOB, you know, it's full of economists. Uh, they're interested in competition. They're not interested in code of conduct. They're not interested in ethics. They're interested in competition. They think, uh, you know, audit firms should be broken up. There should be more audit firms. They should, you know, be taken down in size. They should be put up for a bid. Uh, audit should be reviewed. Auditors should be changed. Uh, all of that is about, you know, competition, uh, rotation of the firm, putting bids. Uh, they're not interested in code of ethics. Code of ethics are taught in the university. Uh, code of ethics is tested on CPA exams, so so students need to know that. Uh, after that, it's how do you make money, you know? Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I think there's a very big gap between what we are teaching and the world in which these people actually work. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Modar, you have a question? Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, uh, Professor Karim. Actually, uh, you, you painted a sort of bleak uh, picture, which, uh, well, it, uh, that's what uh, most of our research <laughs> finds. But uh, any proposals for improving this, for example, in the, in the future or something, what, uh, can you update us about anything, for example, to make CAMs or other types of reporting more uh, effective? Well, one really kind of strong change would be to say, uh, suppose you deregulate an auditing. Suppose you said, uh, you know, people don't have to hire a mandatory auditor. Then you would go back to that world of Deloitte and Edwin Waterhouse. And the auditor would have to convince people uh, that they are useful. And if they didn't convince people that they were useful, uh, nobody would hire them, okay? Uh, you would get a very different kind of audit profession uh, if, you know, if that happened. Now that's a drastic change. Uh, there's some indication that during the Enron time, uh, that was one of the changes that was contemplated by the regulator, that that was actually on the table was, just get rid of this mandatory requirement to hire the auditor, and then you would fundamentally change uh, the incentive structure of the auditor. Okay. Uh, the other problem that you're seeing is audit is increasingly becoming unprofitable. So the consulting side of the business is growing very rapidly. The tax side is growing very rapidly. And then the audit side is becoming this compliance kind of thing where 
it's it's not because of independence rules and a whole pile of other kinds of regulation. Uh, the audit audit did not see this very valuable, so people don't want to pay for it. So you know you're seeing uh, EDO now splitting up. You saw Ernst and Young <laughs> trying to split up. Uh, uh, the consultants and the tax people want to get away from the auditors and don't want to be in the same firm as the auditors. Uh, so again, there's some there's some signals there that you know the the current structure. Uh, is not very viable, is not very profitable, uh, is not professional. And we're kind of making a mess out of things, right? Uh, but but PCOB is hell-bent on competition. And so if they would at least take their foot off the brake on competition, uh, that would be one huge uh, benefit because if they put up audits for bid, and kind of force companies to change auditors. Uh, that will have a huge downward pressure on audit prices. Uh, will have a huge downward pressure on independence. Uh, it will just really make things worse. So, I, so I think PCAOB uh, really makes things worse in the in the broader sense. So, if you, if they would stop doing that. Uh, that would require a, you know, an, a, disc a discussion about what is audit quality and does he, anybody even know what that is? And if you don't know what it is, uh, if it's kind of a credence group, good of some kind, you kind of, you know, you see that it makes you happy, uh, then, then you can't have a market uh, regulate that because the market cannot figure out audit quality and they cannot price it. So, so if you want a small change, uh, you ask PCAOB to stop pushing all this competition stuff they're pushing. If you want a big change, you deregulate audio. That would be a big change. So that Thank would need the, that would need another end round. <laughs> Next end round that might happen. Thank you, Minna Razi. You have any question, Minna? Yes, thank you, doctor, for uh, sharing your knowledge uh, with us. Uh, I'm an Egyptian member in the civil audience institution, uh, and I'm asking uh, about uh, climate change, as uh, I see uh, it's uh, one of uh, the came. And uh, I think companies has uh, a lot of uh, fraud and uh, corruption uh, in that field. Uh, and according to the inside uh, standards uh, of uh, obligating auditors to review climate change actions as a performance audit uh, in one side. And uh, in the other side, we had the, the two main rules of auditing, financial and compliance audit. But every one of them are working uh, separately. Uh, do you think that the same auditor has uh, to make the three types of audit for effective uh, audit and uh, good outputs, like uh, financial for climate finance and performance for uh, climate change indicators? and uh, compliance for legal and uh, conventions. Uh, is that applicable? And uh, what is the requirement for that? Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, so my view is, you know, that accounting and auditing both uh, started as private sector activities. Uh, they evolved uh, through trial and error, you know, so Deloitte was doing one thing and uh, Edwin Waterhouse tried to do something different. And, you know, some of the firms that became Ernst & Young were doing something different yet. And uh, uh, some of the accounting firms uh, who were around at that time uh, survived, some of them uh, didn't. Uh, but the way in which historically accounting and auditing both uh, developed uh, was through trial and error. And so when we say generally accepted accounting standards or generally accepted auditing standards, uh, you know, what that meant, what that truly meant uh, was that, uh, you know, people tried things and some things became popular uh, and, and other people followed. Uh, and the same with double entry bookkeeping, right? Uh, you know, when Pacioli wrote his book, uh, you know, there was no law that said you had to follow that book. Uh, but, you know, but people liked the book and, and maybe most people started to follow it. And slowly people shifted from single entry auditing uh, accounting to double entry audit, you know, accounting. 
So I think the same thing should be done on the environment. I think, you know, there should be some trial and error. I think people should be allowed to try different ways of doing things. I don't think you should rush to standardize things. I don't think you should rush to force people uh, to all do be the same. Uh, you can afford to do that after, you know, you've uh, had 50 years or, you know, of, of people trying different things. Now, maybe we don't have 50 years for environmental or, or we don't want to do it that way. But even for audit reporting, you know, we, uh, if you start with uh, Deloitte, you know, uh, in 18, say 50, uh, audit reports didn't get standardized until the 1930s. So that's like 80 years later, right? So they had 80 years of trial and error, different kinds of audit reports, people trying different things. And then at some point, people said, okay, now we understand this stuff enough. Uh, we can standardize this and we can, you know, get rid of all this variation. So I think all of this auditing, uh, both the accounting standard setting uh, and the auditing side of the environment and new new technologies and new ways of doing things uh, should be experimented with. You know, uh, people should try different things. Uh, standard setters should go very slow. Uh, going into areas they don't understand, uh, crypto, or new kind of technologies, uh, should let people sort these things out, um, see what some of the variation occurs, uh, then, then standardize after you understand, you know, what, what the range of things are and how they're working. Uh, in some of these areas are non-accounting competitors, uh, and so you need to watch them also. They might have very different ways of doing things. Uh, accountants might learn uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, it's unlikely that the kind of monopoly kind of standardized way things are done in accounting today uh, will necessarily work in these new areas. Uh, if they rush too quickly to do the same thing in these new areas that we do in uh, a highly stable uh, accounting environment, uh, most likely it'll fail. Uh, so I think people should go slow uh, on, on standardization. I think they should allow variation. They should allow every firm to try whatever they want to try. <laughs> uh, and see what works, right? So, you know, Deloitte, you know, Deloitte was big until Edwin Waterhouse came in. And Edwin Waterhouse started doing this other stuff and, and Price Waterhouse became a dominant auditor. And they passed Deloitte. And Deloitte kind of did more consulting and did more insolvency and kind of the blue chip auditor became Price Waterhouse, right? But that's because, because Price Waterhouse did things differently, right? Uh, so even though Deloitte was there a long time before Edwin Waterhouse came along, uh, it turned out Edwin Waterhouse was a better auditor, <laughs> you know, and uh, his way of doing auditing uh, actually worked better in the marketplace. And in the long run, the, you know, the, the regulated market became more like what Price Waterhouse was rather than like what Deloitte was. So, so so my view is you shouldn't try and standardize these things too quickly. Let, let, let people try different approaches and see what works. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Tinder. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Karim, for the uh, presentation. Um, I'm speaking from Lagos, Nigeria, and using Nigeria as a case study. What can the auditor do when you don't have enough information to carry out your audit and there is time frame? Um, just yesterday, that was the last uh, day for the submission of the financial statement in Nigeria, although it was extended for two months because it was supposed to be in June. So even till last Monday, we still have people uh, clients uh, sending information to you and to also meet up with uh, last day, which was yesterday. So I just want to know what can the auditor do to follow up with clients 
instead of rushing and to avoid uh, poor um, financial statement and pure, poor reporting. Thank you. Yeah, so, so again, I think, uh, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, uh, Deloitte was successful is, you know, he went and gave his clients advice <laughs> about how to keep the records. Uh, he went and gave his clients advice on internal control systems. Uh, he went and gave his clients advice on accounting standards uh, and how to prepare things. Uh, so, you know, in some sense, he made his clients what you call auditable, okay? So instead of being a bloody mess and they show up on the last day and dump a bunch of boxes or bags on you with a bunch of receipts and kind of say, here, uh, you know, he, he standardized his clients, right? So he taught his clients how to how to keep the records and how to do things in a systematic way so that number one, they themselves got better information. Uh, and then they were not in a complete mess, uh, you know, at the end of the year, kind of dumping stuff. And then, and then they didn't create a mess for the auditor because if they come to the auditor and they're completely disorganized and they just throw a box at you and say, you know, here's my box. Uh, then the auditor has lots of work to do, right? Uh, so I think if if your if your auditing standards allow it, uh, in a sense, you should almost become a, a partner of the client and showing them how to do things properly. Uh, in North America, increasingly, uh, you know, these kind of things are not allowed. But but, that, but then we're talking about publicly traded companies, but. When we're talking about publicly traded companies, they're already pretty large and, and they're pretty sophisticated companies. And so that they should have internal controls and they should have uh, a fair amount of internal accounting expertise, right? Uh, so so I, I think in a developing country where you know maybe that accounting expertise is not uh, as well developed or internal controls are not as well developed, uh, the audit firms can, of course, uh, lobby for that to to have the the rules and the laws require that. Uh, but in the meantime, they can even just work with their clients to improve their systems and improve their records, right? So kind of you make your clients auditable, uh, and making them auditable means that 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 you organize their records and and that's one difference between a company that's audited and a company that's not audited. A company that's not audited can be in a total mess, you know, and nobody knows and and nobody cares because uh, you know who who goes to look at their stuff anyway. Uh, but a company that's audited uh, should not be a complete mess uh, and and should have some structure and some order. Uh, to their basic record keeping uh, all the way up through their internal controls and, and things of that sort, then uh, then I think it'll make it a lot easier for, for both for the company to report properly uh, and for the auditor uh, to audit that, right? So that, that would be my advice to you. All right, thank you. Hamad, you have a question? Hamad yes. Hamid. Yeah. Yes. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad. And uh, uh, special thanks to Dr. Professor Karim for uh, such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I want to ask a question about uh, the uh, audit quality. And uh, as we witnessed the more recently uh, uh, bankruptcy, which was happening in uh, United States, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and uh, the, unfortunately, that bank was audited by KBMG, which was one of the big fours. And from the methodological point of view, uh, that we know that uh, the measurement of uh, or uh, we use audit quality, uh, uh, big fours as uh, a proxy of audit quality. Uh, would you think 
that the measure is enough to cover all the aspect of audit quality? If yes, uh, uh, just show me what kind of aspect. If there is any substitute or uh, need for to improve the uh, another proxy, uh, please you could mention it. And uh, uh, also, could you just mention the uh, uh, future direction regarding the future study in this area? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, <laughs> people don't know what is audit quality or they have trouble uh, saying what is audit quality. Uh, so at least for the purpose of research and kind of from the economic side, you know, an argument kind of first started out, which is that since the market can't tell audit quality, I don't, really don't know what the auditor does. I and mean, if you take that to an extreme, uh, that the market just cannot tell what is audit quality, then, then auditing becomes a credence good. It just becomes uh, one of these goods where uh, you, know, you have it and it makes you feel good because uh, in a way, like I answered on the previous question, it kind of guarantees that the client becomes auditable. It guarantees that the client has proper records, that the client has proper internal controls, that some outside person can actually come and see what the client is doing and, and make sense of it as opposed to the company's in total disarray and nobody knows what the hell's going on, right? Uh, so, so that could be one extreme. The other extreme would be to argue, well, you know, I can't tell, uh, you know, what is audit quality, so I'll use size as my proxy, okay? Uh, so I'll say, look, if you become a big auditor, <laughs> uh, you must be better. Why, might, why are you better? Well, well, number one, you acquired lots of clients. So why would lots of clients come to you uh, if you weren't any good? Uh, so you must be good. That's why lots of clients come to you. Uh, number two, uh, you could kind of say, you know, this is kind of what I touched on with the fraud detection side. Uh, when I'm buying an audit, uh, you know, the company is kind of buying maybe advice on better accounting processes and internal controls and stuff like that. But, but when I'm an investor, I'm also buying insurance. So what I want to know is uh, if this company happens to be fraudulent and goes down, uh, I can sue somebody and collect my money back. And in that sense, the audit firm becomes like an insurance company. Uh, the bigger the audit firm, the more money it has. And if it has lots of money, um, I like that <laughs> because then I can sue them and they can give me my money back because they're big and they won't go under because I saw I sued them uh, and they may not even fight me because you know uh, their reputation is getting tarnished uh, uh, as we go through a legal process uh, so they may want to settle and so they'll settle for a fairly high amount and so I'll get my money back, okay? But if I go to a small firm, uh, number one, they have very few clients. And I'm not sure it's because uh, they don't have quality and they can't do the work uh, or they just don't want to grow. Uh, but if they have a problem, uh, uh, I can't get my money back because you know they'll collapse. Uh, and there could also be more an independence issue, okay? If I have a thousand clients and, you know, one of the clients starts pushing me and saying, you know, uh, I want to do X and, you know, that X is not allowed, I can tell them, you know, buzz off. <laughs> and if I lose one client out of a thousand, uh, you know, that's not a huge problem for me. Uh, but if I'm a small firm, and I've got 10 clients and one of those clients uh, decides to misbehave, 
uh, and I tell them to buzz off, then I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> uh, so again, you know, there's this notion that size creates independence. I can afford to lose clients. Uh, size creates insurance. Uh, I have lots of money and deep pockets, and you can come and sue me if something goes wrong. Uh, and I care more about my reputation because I have, you know, I have a thousand clients. And, you know, if you, if one of them creates a fraud uh, and they ruin my reputation, I might lose lots of clients. Uh, but if I didn't have many clients, uh, I can't lose too many clients. I don't have, I don't have too many clients. Uh, so, and again, it depends who my clients are. If my clients are all small little companies and, and one of them misbehaves, uh, the other companies may not care. Uh, but if my clients are big companies and they go on the stock exchange and they raise money, uh, then they care about my reputation because if my reputation is good, they can go on the market and raise money. But if my reputation becomes bad, then they can't raise money. Uh, so then I'm no use to them. So then they would leave me. So there's a number of reasons why size, uh, you know, could be uh, a proxy, a good proxy for body quality. Uh, the problem is too many studies have been done on size, right? Uh, and then you get into, you know, does size matter uh, internationally? Uh, does it matter by country? Does it matter by city? Uh, and so what you start finding is, uh, it, I don't know, this might be interesting, but you find a lot of local effect. Uh, so, you know, KPMG has a problem in Chicago, then, uh, you know, that damages KPMG in Chicago. They lose clients. Uh, maybe they have difficulty finding new clients. Uh, but then what happens to KPMG in other cities in the U.S.? And it seems to be nothing happens to them. So, so it seems like... Uh, we talk about these firms as if they're global firms, but actually they're national partnerships. And even within those national partnerships, it seems like reputation is very local. Uh, you know, if if something happens to the KPMG office with the Silicon Valley Bank, then, you know, the, that problem occurs in that city and only in that city and not even in the next city. You know, going the next city and the KPMG guy says to you, "What? What Silicon Valley Bank? Like, like that has nothing to do with me." Uh, so, so what's happening on that side now is things are getting more and more narrow. So it seems like uh, you know, uh, the firm name matters, and after mergers occurred, you know, as you went from ten big firms to eight big firms to six big firms to four big firms. Uh, the firm differences started to narrow. Uh, but then there's a city effect. And so in every city, uh, it's like it's a different audit market. And there's a dominant auditor in each city. And that auditor can charge higher prices and has more clients uh, and maybe have lower costs. Uh, and so there are these very local market effects. And so things are going more and more local. So now increasingly people are getting interested in who's the partner, <laughs> you know? Uh, suppose, should, should they disclose my name if I'm the partner? And would my reputation now not be the reputation of KPMG, but the reputation of me? And, you know, if I get into trouble, uh, maybe all of my clients suffer <laughs> because, you know, they're my clients. Uh, but if you're my partner and your office is next to mine, uh, maybe nothing happened to you. Uh, because, you know, I did a bad job doesn't mean anything to you. 
uh, it only means something to me. So again, there's some indication that there are huge uh, variances between firms and within firms, uh, between offices of the firm, <laughs> within offices of the firm, uh, maybe sometimes even, you know, uh, one partner sitting next to the next partner is very different, okay? So uh, I became an auditor, and this is again something people are getting interested in. Uh, I became an auditor at a time when there was some huge uh, recession. And uh, companies were getting into trouble and doing crazy stuff, and the auditors are very strict. And so I started as an auditor uh, at that time, and I'm very strict, and I'm very careful in which clients I select, and I don't take risky clients, and if I have bad clients, I chase them away. And even 20 years later, you know, there's a there's a there's an effect for for me. Uh, versus somebody started as an auditor when there was a boom, <laughs> and the whole economy was flying, money was plentiful, lots of deals were being done, lots of deals uh, shaky, but you know, whatever, everybody just making money and signing off on things. Then 20 years later, I'm still like that. <laughs> you know, I'm signing off on things. I have all kinds of risky clients. And I'm more likely to get into trouble uh, with the regulator. Uh, and we could still both be partners sitting next to each other. Okay. Uh, then it suddenly some means that KPMG versus Deloitte versus PwC doesn't mean very much. Okay, the huge differences from one KPMG partner to the next one. Okay, uh, so now I think there's a lot of interest in in this kind of clientele effects. Uh, you know, uh, so KPMG uh, decided to take on a lot of small banks and become a bank specialist. And a lot of those small banks are going under and suddenly, you know, they're, they're in trouble because uh, all these small little banks are going into trouble and KPMG is auditor of all of them uh, because they were trying to build an industry expertise in that area, right? So, so there are those kind of firm level, sometimes office level decisions, you know, uh, should we take crypto com companies as our clients, uh, which might... Uh, decide the risk level of an office, okay? Uh, and you saw that with Arthur Anderson, you know, I mean, the problem was in Houston, but then uh, it sank the whole firm, but most of the people in the firm didn't even know who this guy was, right? So this guy was a partner uh, in Houston, uh, and maybe even the, maybe the people in Houston knew who he was. And then after you got out of Houston, nobody even knew who he was, even, even within Anderson. Uh, but he sank the whole firm, right? Uh, so again, that's where the legal structure is a bit kind of crazy. Uh, but the interest, I think, in the future, you'll see much more micro-level interests. Uh, individual level reputation. Uh, if countries start uh, asking auditors to sign their names, uh, to audit reports, uh, then tracking uh, differences across audit partners in the same firm, in different firms, uh, in different offices of the same firm, uh, it might actually be quite different, okay? Uh, so again, it suggests that these are not really global, you know, branded, Firm, so they 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 try and sell themselves that way. You know, I'm KPMG, and I'll give you a KPMG level audit all over the world. Uh, so they market themselves that way, but that's not actually how they operate. And there are huge variations in, across countries and across cities, and sometimes within a city and within an office. Uh, the huge variations in terms of uh, the clientele the partners have, the amount of risk they take, uh, their own willingness to accept uh, 
risky accounting practices. Uh, so I think that's where the that's where the future is going. So if you want to get into this kind of line of work, go micro. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Thank macro so stuff. The macro stuff's been done. We kind of know. Uh, you know there are huge uh, city level effects. We know there are industry expertise effects. Uh, if you're an industry specialist auditor, you, you'll get paid more than if you're not. Uh, if you're the biggest firm in the city, uh, you'll get paid more than if you're not. Uh, again, that's a size effect. So, so there's indications that you know the market value size. The market values, industry expertise, uh, but interestingly, there are all these local level effects also across partners. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Karim Jamal, for your contribution and your effort. It's really an excellent presentation and excellent paper. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone joining us today and thank you very much uh, for taking the time out to present it to us dear uh, professor uh, jamal it's been really appreciated well thanks for having me and uh, if you have any more questions you can just email me i'm sure you can you can find me i'm sure easily so yeah and i hope to see you soon in egypt you are very very welcome dear professor karim jamal uh, I'd be happy to come. Thank you. You are very, very welcome. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.